3D Lab guest sessions are online technical talks or collaborative workshops with external practitioners or our in-house technical team. These sessions are hosted by the 3D Lab based at Wimbledon College of Arts, UAL. We seek conversations that reflect the richness of thinking through making, technical research and development, and practical learning and teaching. We aim to explore the making literacies that underpin making practice, and in doing so develop a learning resource within the context of performance and beyond. For previous sessions and to join our mailing list, please visit wca3dlab.myblog.arts.ac.uk. We have the absolute pleasure of just sharing some time with Amit Hindosha. I've known Amit for a good number of years now. I've just really enjoyed watching Amit's practice evolve, develop, and just has solidify uh, over the years. I feel like this conversation that we're about to have is is a snapshot of a, a much longer conversation that has spanned the decade about making and about the helpful things that we can uh, unpick all the making principles uh, that un uh, underlie or underpin our making practice. His practice and the way he's explored his work has always helped me think through my practice and I, I hope that will be helpful for you today to kind of see how he has approached his thinking and his making. Uh, he's first become an internationally sought after specialist in the creative exploration of geometry and he's taught in Spain, Istanbul and at the Prince's School of Traditional Arts. He's also one of our very own technicians. He's based at Camberwell College of Art and he's also actually just started his online uh, school for dedicated kind of exploration in geometry and the expanded field of so uh, without further ado, because I want to give him as much time uh, as possible, let's uh, give a warm welcome to Amit Hindosha. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much, Ash, for the introduction and for inviting me to be here. Uh, great to see this big international bunch of people, lots of familiar names. Uh, makes me feel a little bit more at ease. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk a bit about my practice, um, give a bit of an introduction how I got involved with geometry, particularly as a, as a creative practice, uh, and then to just show some work, talk about particularly the processes, the materials, the tools that I use, uh, and how that kind of feeds into how I've been able to develop things. So yeah, as Ash said, we uh, we've have ongoing conversations over many years uh, around making practice uh, and those conversations have been just invaluable uh, not only with Ash but with many other colleagues and friends um, so it's great to be able to kind of share some of this with uh, a wider audience. Uh, in terms of my background just very briefly uh, having studied graphics and painting at Camberwell um, I basically spent my whole career as a as a graphic designer um, and also working as a member of the technical team first at Wimbledon and in Camberwell and through that I built up a, a sort of range of um, skills to do with technical making processes making literacy basically um, so through the freelance work through other design work and through the technician role uh, I'd always been interested in mathematics and systematic processes. In fact, the interest in graphic design is partly from having those kind of structures and rules to work within has always been my way of finding uh, a mode of expression. Um, in 2014, uh, many thanks to Ash actually for first sort of pointing me in the direction of the Prince's School of Traditional Arts in London where I took a, an incredible, you know, life-changing course at, um, called the Ge Geometry and the Order of Nature. Um, you know, discovering geometry uh, gave me a kind of visual language and a system to explore and understa understand, um, which I've been able to apply through mainly the medium media of paper, print, and pixel-based uh, exploration. Um, th this, that year was a big year in terms of uh, it being a, a massive creative awakening, you know, a realization, a revelation that uh, this practice, this structure could give me so much direction, give me a backbone to my practice, which is something I'd always felt I'd lacked a little bit. 
Um, so to my mind, the creative process is, it's kind of simple, but elusive. Um, <clears throat> it's just basically about having ideas and about realizing them. That's basically the whole game. Everything happens within that. Uh, tools, materials, and processes are the, they, they're what you use to play the game. Um, something that took me a long time to realize, <clears throat> excuse me, is that um, the ideas are kind of the easy part. Once you find something that genuinely interests you, the ideas start flowing. And making is the core of the creative practice. Um, because when you make visual work, you get more ideas, you learn, and you get better at your chosen craft. Uh, there's really nothing else to do. The outcomes, I've started to see outcomes as just indicators of the journey. Um, whereas I think previously I was more fixated on making things that looked a certain way or fulfilled a certain, you know, uh, an outcome. So as far as I'm concerned, making is, is how you think visually. Um, so with reference to, just to give a bit of background about geometry and its role in the visual arts, um, geometry is a visual representation of the number patterns which define the structure of reality that we live in, you know, nature, the cosmos. Uh, the ability to visualize these mathematical principles gives us, um, through an understanding of measurement, proportion and rhythm, an insight into what makes things beautiful and harmonious. And <clears throat> by applying that to what we make, we imbue it with those qualities. Um, geometry, the word geometry, uh, its source is geometria, geo meaning earth and metria meaning measure. So essentially we are understanding and connecting to the world around us through measurement and analysis. Um, most cultures throughout history have used geometry and number as a basis for their art and architecture. Um, the practice, so it goes back through, you know, right to the start of um, human endeavor. Um, but the practice of geometry as a kind of contemplative and practical art uh, gained its sort of first uh, strong importance in classical Greece, particularly in the Pythagorean and Platonic tradition. Um, Pythagoras uh, said that everything is number and Plato referred to it as the art of the ever true. Uh, another key figure um, who influenced geometry uh, from ancient Greece was Euclid whose uh, book, the books or series of books, The Elements, uh, were a foundation for Euclidean geometry which is still absolutely relevant today. Um, and from the time of Pythagoras, the study of number was at the core of the educational system uh, and through the medieval age as well. Um, there were seven liberal arts, the trivium and the quadrivium. The trivium are uh, l based in language, grammar, logic and rhetoric. And the quadrivium are based in number, which is made up of four subjects, uh, arithmetic, which is pure number, geometry, which is number in space, uh, music, which is number in time, and astronomy, which is number in space and time. So there are notable examples of cultures who've developed a distinct visual language with, centered in geometry. Um, a couple of examples would be the Celtic design, uh, the way that they developed um, beautiful manuscript designs uh, and artifacts based often on compass work, you know, free, free and loose. They had a particular way of using compasses as a tool. Um, also Gothic design, the beautiful stained glass rose windows in Western Europe uh, heavily relied on geometry and it's kind of a number and it's symbolism. Um, my particular area of interest is Islamic geometric design, uh, which is an ornamental art form that's developed over centuries uh, across a large part of the world from, you know, Spain all the way to Central Asia. Um, and it's, it's actually a remarkably 
cohesive and consistent kind of visual language, uh, something I like to think of as visual music. So there's very little documentation or evidence about how the designs were constructed, but we have a huge legacy of still existing um, architecture, manuscripts, other artifacts, which incorporate geometry, you know, overtly in the kind of not work patterns, um, and more subtly in biomorphic or floral patterns and in calligraphy. Uh, the, the reason that I've been drawn to this is that there is a highly sort of sophisticated use of geometry and also a high level of craftsmanship in the realization of um, the patterns themselves. Um, then a little bit later during the Renaissance, there was a, a huge renewed interest in Platonism and the discoveries of classical Greece, particularly the idea of geometry and number <clears throat> as a kind of key to the secrets of the universe. Um, you know, figures like da Vinci, Dürer and Kepler um, explored the essential number of nature and geometry. And this informed not only their artistic, but their scientific endeavors and kind of led to, uh, in, in part, to the beginning of science as we know it in the modern world. Uh, and this runs all the way through, you know, in, in more recent times, um, explorers of these sort of realms would be people like Buckminster Fuller, uh, Ron Resch, uh, Olaf Eliasson, um, Rafael Araujo. Uh, so there, and there's so many uh, amazing geometers or origamis who I derive a lot of inspiration from, um, particularly, you know, connected through Instagram, for example. So to summarize, uh, an understanding of geometry and proportion applied through a creative practice um, can teach us about the material world, our place in it, and how to explore it in a design context. Um, so I would like to share with you some work. I'm just going to switch to a camera. So geometry, I actually see geometry itself as a tool which can be explored further through uh, other tools and materials in the way it's realized. So it's been traditionally explored with a ruler and compass. This is a, a vintage compass set. Um, it's probably the most important one. Uh, essentially a compass, you know, it does one thing and a good compass will do it very well. It allows you to draw a circle, which has a center and a circumference. And the other tool is the ruler. And the, the, um, these two simple tools, these two simple and ancient tools allow for uh, the ability to draw a line and an arc. And the interaction between line and arc on a two-dimensional plane, uh, I've come to realize through practice, has infinite possibilities. Um, right. So I'm going to do this basically. I didn't want to do a uh, screen slideshow, so I've sort of got piles of work all around my studio that I'm going to stick in front of the camera, as well as talk about the tools and the processes involved. So the drawing is basically the core of um, my creative practice. And there's a, a clarity and simplicity that comes from being able to work with such simple tools. There's a kind of interface between the head, the hand, and the materials you're working with. And I find that the simpler and clearer this, this sort of feedback loop is, uh, the clearer thinking develops out of it. Now, often traditionally, the underlying structure wouldn't be included in this. Uh, I find it extremely beautiful, and it's almost like having a clue to the to the structure, a clue to the underlying secrets. Uh, so for me, it's quite an important part of, you know, it's something I like to leave in. Uh, I don't, I'm not, don't really see myself as a painter, but uh, color and particularly contrast are 
such essential parts of being able to read these types of patterns um, that I, I do use a little, little bit of paint here and there. So what you've seen so far are all kind of hand produced by hand, just ruler and compass and various drawing implements. Um, so talking about tools, tools I find extend the capabilities of your hands and they can lead to a deeper and clearer understanding. Uh, yeah, so this one uh, leads me to some tools that I've, I'm kind of become interested in making tools as well. Um, one of the classical problem, you know, geometric problems um, from antiquity was the fact that you cannot trisect an angle with a ruler and compass. This has since been proved to be the case. It is actually impossible to do it with 100% accuracy. Now this figure is based on nine divisions of a circle. Um, so you can very adequately, you know, accurately enough for how accurate you can actually draw by hand, you can make this kind of ninefold division of a circle. Um, however, it can be a bit fiddly and the computer, it can actually do exact trisections. Uh, so this is a, a tool I made uh, it's laser cut and so the, the Islamic geometry is, is one of its core sort of principles is the division of the circle, regular division of the circle. And then once you have a regularly divided circle, you can put in these type of star motifs or this very characteristic rosette motif. Uh, now, obviously you can use a protractor. There is um, some very um, sort of contemplative, meditative purity in working just with ruler and compass. And I, I largely do that. Um, but this disc allows division, uh, certain uh, divisions like division into nine and seven, which are not possible with ruler and compass. This just has holes in it for a quick division into uh, 36, 28 and, and 20, I think it is. Um, some of these divisions, particularly 28, well, one seventh of a circle is actually 51.42 degrees. It's, even with a protractor, it's gonna be hard to be accurate. And this allows for some level of speed. Um, also, we have uh, the set square. Now this one is, is very common based on uh, 30, 60, 90 degree right angle triangle. What's less common is uh, these ones, which allow for they're based on other regular divisions so they don't you know it's not something that you can find um, manufactured um, but for me with the work I do these particular angles are very useful and these extra divisions within it are very useful uh, and finally there's a golden section one as well with various markings so I'm, I'm really interested in making tools you know, making tools that allow uh, capabilities to be extended. Um, so this is an example of a drawing made with uh, a plotter machine, which essentially has a head that it's actually used mostly for cutting vinyl. You can use it for cutting paper and you can replace the blade with a pen. Um, so this kind of thing becomes possible. So drawn digitally, drawn in Illustrator, and then that controls the pen. So we, we kind of teetering on this edge between digital and analog. Uh, there's something about the flawless perfection of um, digital outcomes that leaves me a bit cold. And the plotter is actually a really interesting tool for, because it marks the paper with a pen, that naturally means there are imperfections, um, but it has a kind of crispness and clarity that you can't really do work with by hand. 
Um, obviously, today we're focusing on visual art and design, but um, I think that any creative endeavor can follow a similar process, whether you're talking about music, writing, cooking, even martial arts. So for example, with music, um, learning an instrument, learning scales, building a repertoire of existing music that you, you learn and you practice will lead you to the point where you start being able to compose your own music. You know, you understand the structures well enough that you can explore yourself. Um, martial arts is also an interesting one. Uh, the body is the tool and the material and you apply a process to work with it. So through sustained practice, a tool becomes so familiar that you can start to use it more intuitively, which means that you no longer need to think through everything, but you're able to feel and express your ideas and express yourself. And the only way to this is to just spend time with it. Um, something I'm particularly interested in as an aspect of Islamic geometry is that despite um, these patterns having been in these structures, you know, this visual language having been explored for hundreds of years, it's far from used up. Um, you know, there are infinite possibilities and it, I've found it, it went, you know, once you reach a level of proficiency, you can discover new patterns from, um, from the principles. So, you know, the po possibilities are drawn out from the matrix. So you have a matrix, you start with, um, the indefinable point at the center, the circle, the division of the circle, and then from there you develop a matrix, bearing in mind that the word matrix comes from the Latin mater or mother. And from this, you then construct patterns. And also bearing in mind the word pattern comes from pater or father. So at this point, this is, you know, you, you build the matrix, you have the pattern and this is almost theoretical until you birth from the mother and father you know it exists in the imagination and you birth it in the application of the pattern through materials um <clears throat> so just a little camera switch i'm gonna just show you a couple of things on screen because digital um Digital drawing is as much a part of my practice as working by hand. Uh, so this just to give you a few examples of stuff. I mainly use Illustrator as my kind of finishing tool. Um, also quite interested in using texture, especially handmade, hand scan textures to try and just knock back that flat perfection crispness that you get from Illustrator. So the interplay between working digitally and working with ruler and compass has been for me extremely fruitful. I, I find that the two things feed into each other. Often there isn't even a distinction. I will just head for one or the other, but I'll always have the other process in mind as well. Um, and then further possibilities like this are uh, are made available through digital tools. You know, this is something certainly not to this extent of how small it goes, uh, it wouldn't really be possible by hand. Um, we also do some commercial work. This is a project which so it's kind of strange because most of what I make, I actually has, has a physical presence. And while, while this, uh, had a realization in um, billboards. I never, this was in America, I never actually got to see this. So it's sort of a bit strange having this uh, only digital thing that I made. Um, also in terms of drawing tools, one of my favorite discoveries is um, this tool, GeoGebra. So just to demonstrate, this is a, a digital drawing tool. It's centered on being able to visualize geometric concepts is often used for teaching, but it's allow, it allows for 
a uh, you know this kind of interactive um, tool to be made and what this has allowed me to do is understand some of the generalized principles that underlie Islamic geometry and be able to visualize and explore them through using these tools. So this is all stuff that had adds to my kind of uh, the depth and clarity of my understanding to be able to use movement and interaction to be able to work with these tools. Um, right, sorry, just gonna head back to a um, couple of other. So another another area of interest in terms of outcomes is printmaking. Um, so I've used a laser cutter to cut a set of shapes which have which which are part of essentially uh, what I see as a vocabulary of shapes. Um, and I refer to them as a vocabulary because they can be put together in a variety of different ways. Uh, I mean, when I say variety, I mean endless different ways. There's a couple of different vocabularies of shapes based on different symmetries that fit together. And uh, I then stick these pieces down by hand into, uh, into a design and then ink it and relief print. And I found this to be a very interesting, another fruitful way of exploring uh, the connections between these shapes. Um, that's an example of one of these tile prints. <clears throat> So I'm not going to talk too much about this project because I've presented it a couple of times. I've actually written a paper about it, which you can find on my website if you're interested in the connections with language and the particular process of this. Um, something I wanted to say about the computer is, uh, of course, it's a an extremely powerful tool with many strengths and it's very complex. Uh, it, it, it has a, one of its strengths is being able to simplify repetitive tasks and to be accurate. And these are two things that are kind of, they're essential to the practice of geometry. You know, there's a lot of repetition and you need to be accurate. Uh, so it's very versatile as a tool, but it's very distracting as well. It does, it almost does too many things. Um, and can draw us away from that clarity that you get with a simpler tool. It also requires a lot more learning. Um, I find that it can rob you of the gift of immersion in a, in a repetitive process. You know, this is something that craftsmen know very well. Carving a piece of wood by hand gives you the time to contemplate the design, uh, to connect with the materials, to understand why you're doing what you're doing. And the opportunity to develop this kind of clarity of intent is something that should be savored. Um, of course, I'm not anti-technology, um, but I think something that's very much overlooked. Um, it, it can be, the computer can be seen as a quick way of doing things. And actually, I think there is a degree of craftsmanship in digital tools, the same as any others. Uh, you know, the same, same as any other skill, you should expect to spend many hours to develop a true proficiency and basically to make the tool an extension of yourself. So one thing that I think is really important in learning digital tools is the ability to find the all important flow state, you know, to get into that kind of headspace. Uh, so I, I find that the computer is often part of a fluid interaction between processes working digitally and analog, and analog as well. Um, so one of my favorite materials is paper, not only as a two dimensional surface, but as a two dimensional surface, which can move through three dimensions. Wow. I've got a whole box load of, or I've, I've actually folded a ridiculous mountain of origami in the last year, um, which I'm having trouble storing. 
Um, but I've picked uh, just a handful of interesting, some of my favorite bits and pieces. Um, so one of the things that I've really enjoyed with paper folding is that the, the, what I was talking about, the interaction between the head, the hand, you know, the eye, the hand, and the material. There is no, there's nothing in between you. It's just your fingers and paper. And there's a whole world of origami that, that involves, um, you know, no cutting, no gluing. Uh, and most of what I'm going to show you here are, are all single sheets of paper with just folds. So this, um, this helix spiral, which collapses down completely flat, it's just folded from a single rectangle. Um, it has a lot of interesting applications, engineering applications, this lovely thing, for example, folded flat, quite small, then opens out like this. I'm obviously drawn towards connecting the surface design with the geometry of the origami as well. So this, this is based on a fold which is often used for taking solar, solar panels out to space. So they're taken like this, and then with a simple action, they can unfold into a much larger object. Um, there are several categories within paper folding, um, particularly interested in corrugation, which involves a kind of up and down modulation of a sheet of paper. And this type of thing has this one, I don't know if I'll be able to do it properly, but it will, it will kind of curl up as you squeeze on it. Pretty strange and interesting. Um, this stuff has a lot of interesting applications with other materials. You know, what we learn from, I mean, for me, paper is, is just, that's a material in itself. However, we can learn stuff from how paper folds and how simple versatile it is to work with to understand about other sheet materials. So I folded this from a sheet of plastic, which was actually surprisingly different to, to work with, you know, to make the folds, you have to score it, it holds its shape more, so you have to kind of squeeze it into the shape you want more rigidly before it will hold its form. Um, but these principles can be applied to um, other sheet materials, fabric, um, metal, wood. This little thing involve, uses a, a actually remarkably simple pleating technique that has a lot of applications with fabric and textile. Um, that's another favorite of recent times. I need to make a few more of those. This is actually, again, really simple, just based on a square grid and its diagonals. Um, there's also a lot of crossover potential. This is something which is, it's a folded sheet of paper, uh, which has Celtic knotwork designs in the various parts of the folded structure. So because there's a correlation between how the square grid is used in origami <clears throat> and Celtic knotwork, um, I kind of thought of that as a interesting possibility. Also very keen on, um, this type of moving possibility, kinetic possibilities of paper. So, you know, you're taking a two dimensional material and allowing it to move through the third dimension and to settle into three dimensional shapes. I mean, it's, it's so, so simple, so satisfying. And, you know, all of these are hand folded single sheets of paper. Um, Oh yeah, this is a nice one relating to the um, relating to that one. This one starts with a collapses down to a pentagon with another pentagon inside, all connected with the golden ratio, and then expands out and has this potential for connecting with surface pattern design as well. Um, Another nifty little moving 
contraption. I think gives me a lot to think about. Um, right. My last little box of stuff. So the, the current obsession for me is um, polyhedra. I've been very interested in working with three dimensions and the, the geometry of three dimensional space. Um, so oh, that's not a polyhedra, but that's a particularly beautiful. Also very interested in fractals. You know, there's something about self similarity that can lead to um, that, that tells us something about the way the universe works. Right, let me just lay out a few of these bits. So what these, these drawings of three dimensional forms, this one here is the same as this form. Very powerful, striking form. Lots of interesting proportions within that. Um, these two I just folded the other day. Amazingly, these are folded from six strips of paper. This is six strips of paper braided together. So this the, the paper goes over and under itself. You can kind of see a bit more clearly on these. So the strips kind of go over and under, and these are two variations of the icosahedron. Possibly my favorite thing I've made of late is this icosahedron. This one's carved from a piece of alabaster. So this was where, you know, this, this kind of communicates that idea we're spending the best part of the day carving, polishing a piece of stone to reveal this form from a cube brought me not only satisfaction, but time to contemplate the form, to build a connection with it, to really understand what was going on within it. Um, also really interested in paper cuff. I don't know how clear this will be. This is a Mobius strip made from paper cut with a, with, it's a it's sort of, to me, it's another way of expressing infinite pattern, which is what Islamic pattern is all about. Some kind of connection and expression of the infinite while, while acknowledging that we can't possibly understand this concept. There we go. So, you know, a lot of these things may, will turn into larger pieces realized in stronger materials and stuff, but that just as a delicate strip of paper and how the whole thing is, it's actually, it, it constantly varies. The patterns doesn't, doesn't really, I mean, it repeats in the sense that it's a small set of shapes, um, but it keeps morphing as you go around it. Uh, and finally, another thing I'm working, well, not quite finally, sorry. <laughs> um, this is based on a ceiling in, uh, in the Alcazar in Seville and uses just a slight three dimension, it's actually a ceiling, so it'd be the other way up and you'd look, you'd look up into it. But it kind of morphs this octagonal eight fold geometry into tenfold pattern around the edge. It's quite a remarkable bit of geometry. Yeah. I mean, I've got mountains of stuff I could go on, but I'll just, I'll show you one last thing. This, this, really sums up for what I love about geometry. This cube, which is known as the Schatz cube, um, discovered by Paul Schatz, or uh, the invertible cube. It has these two bolts in it. If you remove these two bolts, you're left with this, which has this incredible twisting, folding motion. It goes through so many different interesting states. And there's the triangle there where it will lay flat. It will open out and that triangle will fit 
inside there, so it's kind of inverted itself out completely. Just has this. So this is where, you know, I made this and I understand the angles and the triangles involved in it. But somehow when I pick it up and move it, I just still can't believe I'm just filled with wonder at the the possibilities of geometry and how you know we can express these things in physical terms. And then those two slot back in. You can see that it's just a cube with a couple of bits taken out. So kind of staggering. Um, Amazing. I mean, I think that's a good good point. To yeah, start. That is, that's where I was going to say. That. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it's so good, actually, and it, uh, just to see your evolution, actually, even even in in the way that you've presented. You know, going talking about the tool, looking at like the matrix and the form behind the kind of emerging pattern and then how mm. that then slowly like develops and changes and the applications of it. Um, yeah. And, and I also just love that when you, um, that definition or the etymology of geometry, what was it again? Geometria, was it? Geometria, yeah. Earth, mm. earth measure. So it's, earth, it's, it's yeah. so so deeply connected to you know that it's a practice that connects us with what's around so yeah and i guess that because you, you said about you know geometry giving you a sense of, or, or just it's implicitly like a um a tool or a a, a process for you to be analytical uh, about uh making and it is kind of mm. this beautiful seamless link of like uh you know I think often when we are talking with our theatre design students um, uh, and other courses at Wimbledon, we're, we're thinking that yeah. we, we're thinking about making as a thinking tool um, mm -hmm. in order to inform design, or not to separate the two, or you know, not to be designing in isolation from the making process. And I think yeah. what you've shown is just how actually they can be so intrinsically linked. Um, you know, the kind mm. of the, the design making. I just wondered if you wanted to unpack a bit more about, um, you know, just your experience of geometry as this kind of tool, but it's also kind of helped you unpack mm. or integrate mm. or merge these two processes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was that was the, the key part in the creative awakening that I experienced was, you know, that I I had this sort of um, this backbone of things to explore, and everything I explored. Not so. There's there's you know infinite patterns. Just talking about 2D Islamic geometry. You know, leaving the origami and a polyhedra and other things aside. You know, just two dimensions. Um, so many possibilities of pattern. And then each pattern has possibilities in how it can be realized, how it can be made. And the connection, each time you make one of those, uh, it just leads to more, it leads not only to deeper understanding, but to further ideas. You know, it, it, it's, I, I find they're inseparable now. I, I don't, I've, I mean, I've now, you know, I used to struggle with having ideas because I didn't have this sort of backbone behind what I was doing. Uh, since discovering geometry, I, you know, the amount of ideas is, is overwhelming. I used to think it would dry up, but I, you know, it's still, I, I have to kind of make sure I don't get too obsessed because I know that I can't, I now know that I can't realize all these ideas. And when I make something, it just branches out into another 20 ideas. So, you know, I, I, if I, if I didn't think of another idea from now on, I'd probably still take me 20 years to get through the lists I've written. Um, I, I guess that's really I think that's really key is how how the making and the thinking have just melded into one thing and there isn't any distinction it all it's all part of the same process just a loop you know and I guess that's indicative of geometry itself right it's sort of infinite is an affinity to it and uh, just by the very yeah. nature of how you know and I, I think we've spoken a lot about how that's just uh, even uh, reflecting nature in the world around us, which you touched upon um, in uh, parts of your um, sharing. Um, mm. 
and another thing that was so intriguing and so applicable for um, us as we work in workshop environments um, mm. is just thinking about tools. And I just really loved how, you know, first off, you talk very strongly about, you know, understanding the tool, uh, you know, and the simplicity that it affords, the extension of the hand. But then there's also this lovely, wonderful development when you know your tool so well that actually you start to see opportunities for developing new tools to assist even further exploration. Um, mm. And yeah, I just wondered if you wanted to share, you know, when did that start that you started to then think through the tool element? I mean, I know, um, uh, you know, a lot of technicians uh, in the past have kind of developed tools uh, as we, you know, or jigs or things to kind of assist making in, in mm. some shape or form, you know, shortcuts, all sorts of things. But uh, yeah, I just wondered if you could uh, share a bit more about um, your development of tools. Yeah, I think um, it's something that I guess just realizing that um, just paying attention. I mean, I have to say a lot of this stuff is not stuff I've I've, I've tried to not think too much, you know, as I'm saying, I think doing and making is what lead, what gives you the understanding. So I don't necessarily give everything kind of conscious consideration, but I think that, um, to, you know, the need to build a tool or to make a tool with a certain uh, purpose arises from noticing that there is a problem to be solved and in many ways for example oh. that that disc with the the dots in it um for dividing the circle i mean in many ways there is no need for there are protractors and there are compasses and all the things that this simple tool can do are possible with that however this allows me to use divisions that i make regularly um very quickly and very accurately and to me that it wasn't that there was a problem it's it's that the idea for the tool presented itself and with some of these tools i've actually gone i just make that and then i use it in my practice and then i see how the thing can be developed um and or what re relevance it has or you know that kind of thing uh i also in terms of that that breakthrough moment or no it's not really a moment the the breakthrough realization that you have developed a proficiency um you know with my use of it i've been using adobe illustrator for 20 odd years um and you know through using it specifically for geometry and drawing islamic patterns it's actually not the best tool for being accurate it can be a bit fiddly but i was already using it and i found i've developed my own techniques that allow me to work quicker, more accurately and open up new possibilities with the tool. And what I find now is um, I can, I will have sometimes thought the whole process through um, because of Illustrator becoming an extension of my thinking. Um, and because I use it so frequently in the work, I find that I'll have it all processed. I know exactly what I need to do so that when I sit down, it'll take me five minutes to knock something out because the tool has become embedded into my, it, it's become part of my capabilities. And that doesn't mean just using the tool, but the tool and its own possibilities have become what I can do. Um, so that's kind of the hope and intention, I guess, with making the tools is to, make them see how they fit in and then maybe they start to have their own relevance and um the set squares i have to say i haven't used a great deal but the disc i found very useful and yeah that's that's kind of how it goes um it's ex ex exploration that's kind of you know i don't i don't really see any of this as um specifically um to make a thing you know the making of things is just what i do and if you make things, <laughs> things get made. It sort of sounds silly, but you know, I'm not trying to make uh, a specific thing necessarily all the time. You know, the out the outcomes just the outcomes just tumble out because I make stuff. Uh, it's a consequence of the making process. And you know, I would I would 
I would and do strongly recommend any anyone who's involved in creative practice to to you know to do that just stop thinking about it uh, don't unconvince don't have an idea and unconvince yourself that you should bother making it or that it would be rubbish or and which is what I spent you know most of my career doing until all this happened to me uh, you know and now it's just I just make stuff. I think that's a common theme that's emerged in these guest sessions. Actually, our, our, our last session with, with was with Foster and Hayes, these um, installation mm -hmm. and performance makers, and they actually touched upon, you know, the importance of having materials around you and starting. Um, yeah. You know, regardless. And actually, it was interesting coming uh, that coming from uh, performance makers, which may sometimes mm. historically have uh, a certain way of getting to a, a making point, you know, in terms of the uh, sort of timeline of, of of events or process, but actually they, you know, mentioned the importance of just, just having stuff around, you know, and starting. Um, and I think that f speaks to what you were talking about, the feedback loops between head, hand and materials. And James in the mm. chat has just kind of summed it up and he was like, you know, head, hand, materials, feedback loops, the gift of immersion when making and, you know, the tools of extension of thinking. Um, and he's just saying this all translates beautifully into so many different art forms. And you've just, you know, you've touched on a, a few different um, kind of uh, places where this might be applicable, but actually it's applicable in loads of different areas. And I know you sent me a link just the other week looking at Robert Lang's um, uh, origami, you know, as an origamist, him speaking into mathematics and science and, uh, you know, the exploration of, um, yeah, that idea of problem solving actually that you touched upon, yeah. that actually uh, just the simple act of thinking through a problem and then how these elements or these principles of making, you know, geometry, measurement tools, process, uh, all tend to help solve that problem. But it's fascinating yeah. how these principles that you're specifically talking about are so expansive um, and mm. can be applied in so many different ways. Um, but yeah. uh, if people are interested, I definitely recommend uh, that link. It's on a TED Talk, if you just Google. Yeah, uh, TED Talk by Robert Lang. Yeah, yeah Robert Lang. Um, I think that's a good kind of follow-up kind of uh, little resource. Um, Talking about tools, a lot of people have touched upon the uh, digital uh, side of your work, and, and I think mm. you have ex you've answered some of them in terms of just not seeing the digital as separate from the analog or the physical, but actually they are um, intrinsic. Um, and actually, just you know, knowing uh, Adobe, a lot of those tools, even the names of tools, are, are based upon. The, the physical, you know, if you th yeah, think about, you know, Photoshop, all those tools are named after the darkroom uh, elements. Um, mm. And yeah, I wondered if you could speak a little bit more, or uh, I think some people are calling for just specifics in terms of like, you've touched upon Illustrator and also the other program, what was it, Geo? GeoGebra, uh, yeah. GeoGebra. Um, you know, maybe you could touch upon a little bit more about how they interlink, like the, the digital and the analog. Um, and then mm. there, there's also a question of timing. Um, so how, you know, how long? Uh, but I think that's almost like, uh, how long is a piece of string in terms of like, you know, I think the question is like, how, how much time do these things take to create, but maybe you can sh share maybe different things take different amounts of time to produce. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> like 50 thoughts in my head now. Um, it just one thing to say from an earlier point about geometry as a making literacy. So this is a term that Ash has been um, using recently and I think really beautifully sums up what as technical staff at, at the UAL, what we try to impart is, and what we try to help students, guide students with, is developing their literacy with making. Um, so a whole range of things that can en encompass. Uh, I think geometry itself is so key, it, 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 further than geometry, you know, number and mathematics as an under uh, as an underlying principle, an ordering principle, you know, it's an ordering principle of the universe. And 
it's also an order, you know, a structural principle that can be applied to any art form um, within the visual arts anyway. Um, and I think that some of the I think that some of the principles, you know, this idea of uh, having this immersion in making, you know, I mentioned stuff like cooking. I, I mean, cooking is is a great example as well. You know, you can either follow a recipe, um, but if you're so inclined through following recipes, you develop an understanding of what flavors go together, which ingredients combine well, what uh, cooking process, amount of heat, what uh receptacle you cook in you know how you bring these things together and then you're making um you're making music you're making taste music i don't know what you call it um it's that kind of thing you know i think that the idea of using your your head your heart your hand and tools to extend all of those is is a way of kind of connecting and bringing you know to be able to express yourself so uh, you know, I think that proficiency with tools just there's n there is no other way than spending time. And, you know, I think if you get obsessed with how long is it going to take me to get good, um, you're going to be put off a little bit. Um, and the same goes for making the work. Now, obviously, a lot of um, a lot of digital. So what you know, what digital tools do for us often is allow us to do things quicker which shouldn't be seen just i think as a or i don't see it as just a way of making um of, of getting it done quicker but i think it allow, it opens up your perception to new possibilities you know you 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 get certain things done quicker and that allows you if you attune yourself well to it it allows you to think further, deeper, and more expansively about what you do. And that's what I found with Illustrator. However, you know, I still struggle with that. There's some evenings where I, I don't want to look at a computer. Uh, I don't want to have to, I still have to battle a little bit from either getting distracted or just finding the very um, static physical position. And the, and the, you know, talking about the interface between your head, heart and hand and the work itself, you have a mouse and a screen and the mouse is already um, a small rectangle, well, well, sorry, I've got a trackpad, but you know, it's, it's a small thing that limits your capability of movement. I mean, you're doing this and you're looking in a box, which is flat, you know, that compared to spending a day carving this thing and feeling the weight of it in my fist, uh, I mean, it's, it's incomparable. Um, this took much longer than it would to shape the same form and to 3D print it, for example. But I've then put a bunch of uh, divisions between me, the experience and the work itself. Uh, and, you know, this is not, none of this is to invalidate the use of these tools. I just think it's important to be conscious of um, the limitations and and how each tool works you know and to to develop that clarity of intent that i mentioned before you know why do you do what you do why are you interested in what you're interested in and therefore how should you go about doing it you know that like when you when you start to understand why you're interested in things and um you know your intent your intention for doing these things uh, you start to develop a clearer understanding of what you want to do. So, you know, something like that took me the best part of the day, but I was in a lovely workshop in Sussex with some friendly people and we were chatting about the platonic solids. I mean, you know, it was great, lovely day. Um, that, that sounds like heaven for you. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, um, you know, some of the origami, it can range from quick things to things that have to be tinkered with over a longer period. So I tend to have a bunch of things. So it's, it's hard to say really how long mm. an actual drawing will take. Cause I mean, I've got young kids and it's like, especially this last year, it's been snatched moments here and there. 
there's sort of two two questions left really i know we've gone okay. slightly over time but it's so valuable we do uh, have a few questions there's a question about sound from sarah bias um, she was just wondering if you've seen images of the pattern forms made by playing sound waves through liquid and uh, I guess, yeah i don't think you have mentioned it but actually you know uh, you have loads of experience in sound, have taken sound yeah. quite seriously as part of your practice as well, which we haven't really touched upon. But I wondered if you wanted to just, you know, quickly share a little bit about m maybe any findings you've had in terms yeah, of sure. geometric um, forms within sound. I might take the opportunity to play this uh, in working on collaboratively with a friend of mine. Um, yeah, movement. I, so the, the the those those patterns. Uh, I believe it's chimatics uh, or cymatics. I don't know how you say it. Um, when you uh, put sound waves through, like pure sign, you know, um, pure frequencies played through liquid or often on a on a tray of sand, and that can. What happens is certain frequencies the patterns arise and they're very, they're very geometric. They're very based in number. And this is sort of not a surprise in the sense that when you think about music and sound, um, it, it is entirely based on number as well. When you take a piece of string, when you halve that length of string, you know, you go one octave up and there are many other connections that I'm not deeply versed in, but um, connections between geometry and number and music and sound. And so one area that I haven't really touched on in my work is animation. So I kind of went from 2D uh, to, to a 2D plane moving into 3D and then into the three-dimensional polyhedra. You know, adding time and movement into the equation is just another whole realm of possibility, you know, and, and again, more understanding, more, um, possibilities um yeah this is i've realized quite how bright and psychedelic this is anyway this is a, a, a piece that's going to be connected with sound um so yeah very interested in those those types of connections too and then just lastly uh people uh were asking um you know and obviously quite inspired to kind of get cracking and, and maybe look into some of these elements and principles themselves mm. and they were just asking for some resources and paul jackson's uh, uh book came up which i know in the 3d lab we actually have mm. quite a lot of them i have one of his right here next to me called complete pleats which i've been working with our costume students with and um so that he's quite a useful reference i don't know is there any other go-to kind of books um apart from well, the uh, kind of greek greats that you mentioned right in the beginning mm. um, are there any kind of go-to references you would suggest um so with regards uh oh i don't know where to start um with regards paper folding yeah the paul jackson stuff is is good and interesting um there are just so many people on on Instagram doing incredible stuff. Uh, God, I'm trying to think now of, of people. Eric Gierde is someone who's done some excellent. Um, he's got an excellent book about uh, origami tessellations. Um, I would definitely look at the work of Ron Resch, um, R-E-S-C-H, um, just put it in here. There's an excellent film called the paper and stick film, I think is on YouTube. I found that massively inspiring. So he kind of, he, he worked with corrugations um, and he, he discovered a huge amount of possibilities with it. And particularly interesting is how he took the principles of working with paper and applied them to, um, to other materials and to much larger scale you know much like buckminster fuller you know working architecturally with different materials but taking these principles that come from the modulation of paper uh and he also worked with polyhedra and light and color and like i mean the film's staggering some of the things you see him 
he's got some some you know huge sculptures that he's moving around with his hands and it, it's hard to believe that it's actually happening and that he made it with his own hands um definitely worth checking him out um well, i would probably stop you there because yeah. you could go on for ages yeah. i know <laughs> yeah. so uh thank you so much and um uh, I mean, one one question was just asking, where did you learn from an origami master? And I think right now it's true to say that you are an origami, you know, you're, you're a ge geometric master. And we're just so thankful for your time today. Thanks so much for just spending time. In thank the you. Thank you very much, Ash. And thank you all for, for your attention and for, for being here. Um, it's so encouraging and so inspiring, like in so many diverse kind of areas. And I knew this would happen. So I'm so thankful that you said yes to coming and coming to share your work. And yeah, you glad of, to do it. You can kind of see in the chat that there's um, yeah, a multitude of thanks yeah, uh, in the space. Um, so I just wanted to flag people to say, hey, like a, a meet is actually a, a resource uh, to learn from. And hopefully you've learned from him today. And um, you can also follow him on Instagram. I, um, he's one of my favorite Instagrammers. Uh, it's at Ambi Ambigraph, A-M-B-I-G-R-A-P-H. One more big thanks to, to me. Thank you so much. I, I just love that. Thank you. Thanks, Ash. And thank, thank you, everyone, for, for coming along. And I hope it's of some, uh, some use and inspiration to you all.